evening. Welcome to On The Bench, the only sports discussion show for Northern Lincoln Gen, East Yorkshire, right here on Estuary TV. On the show tonight, we'll be taking a look at the sports news that's been hitting the headlines this week, and as well as shining a light on the local sports clubs and events that are taking place right here in our area. Coming up later this evening, Tom and Stu will be here to answer your questions in a view from the estuary. And not content with being in the studio, Stu has also been on location to the Bradley Football Development Centre in Grimsby to watch Cleethorpe's Town take on Grimsby Borough in the Lincolnshire Senior Trophy. We're joined in the studio tonight by the East Riding Referee Development Officer Steve Lazenby and one of the more opinionated regular guests of ours, Chairman of Grimsby Borough Football Club, Mr Ken Vincent. More with them in just a minute. But first, something we had lots of interest in at last week's show, here's Team Talk. Luke Maskell went from hero to zero in the FA Vars second round match against Morpeth Town. After equalising with Cleethorpe's Town, he later received a red card and was sent off along with Ricky Forrest. They then missed two penalties which added to their frustration, losing the game 6-1. The Owls currently remain second in the table. David Dean got Grimsby Borough a well-deserved point in front of a healthy crowd at Shybrook, drawing one all. A great result for Borough, as last week Shybrook, you may recall, took a 12-0 win over Appleby Frodingham. A tough trip for Borough next on Saturday, where they head to Bottisford, who won 7-0 in their last game. And you may have heard that a certain Kevin Keegan was in town to support one of our local charities, Harbour Place. Well, I managed to catch a quick word with him on the, on the evening. Here's what he had to say. I think it's very important to support any charity at the moment. You know, everybody knows that that a lot of the funding has been taken away from charities, so they're having to work a lot harder and, and, and getting less money to, to use in a time when actually they could do with more. You know, problems aren't getting smaller, they're getting bigger. But this in particular is a, a, a very good one. You know, it's, it, it's giving help to people who a lot of people don't want to help, and yet they need that help so badly. And, it's, it's some great stories of people who've actually turned their lives around through the support of places like Arbor Place. And you know, you can say that right down the country, it's not just here in Cleethorpes. And uh, the work that the people put in is, is unbelievable. And um, the rewards sometimes aren't as obvious uh, as, as some others, but nevertheless, when you hear some of the stories, you know that they're doing a great job and, and it's a charity well worth supporting. My stories are not just football based, you know, I talk about my life, uh, I talk about present day situations and, and what, you know, where football is now compared with our play. I've looked back at uh, how Grimsby were doing the year I was born, so the, the Grimsby Town fans were here in 1951, sure they, they, they actually finished second in the league and got promoted, so that was a good season for Grimsby. Mm -hmm. And then I go on to things like airstyles and, you know, stuff like that. So that the ladies in the room, a lot of them come up to me and say, you know, yeah, I used to have my hair like yours. None of the guys, well, some of the guys, but not many of them. I played four years for Scunthorpe and they actually made me a professional footballer and gave me the chance to go on. So that's in, you know, in my genes. I can't take that away. And then I thought, but I'm coming to Grimsby. So I, a draw was a perfect <laughs> result. Without a doubt, the, the proudest moment for me was when I played for England. I actually was, my first cap was Bobby Moore as my captain and Sir Alf Ramsey as my manager. And of course, they, they won the World Cup in 66. I, I, I just tagged on the end. You know, when you walk out with that ball and, and, and the, the gift you're going to swap with the German captain or the Spanish captain, whoever it is, and you think to yourself, wow, I, you know, I'm actually leading out my country, you know, in, in in football, I'm, I'm actually captain of England. So uh, that was much better than anything I won as a player uh, or any cups we won, you know, that, that was the big thing for me. I was fortunate to manage a lot of really good players. Of course, I, uh, with England, I managed Beckham, who, who again was absolutely fantastic and very easy to manage. You know, people think sometimes because they got big names, they're difficult, but sometimes I found the biggest names are the easiest. The amazing thing about it is when I played, Grimsby was a big club and, and, and we, we were the smaller club and, and it's, sort of gone the other way around a little bit turned, yeah. at the moment. But, uh... What a genuine chap he is. Mm. Time now to chat to one of our guests this evening, Steve Lazenby. Steve, sounds very interesting this job. Tell us some more about what you do. Uh, my main role within the refereeing is to uh, just recruit, retain and develop referees within the East Riding. Um, from my point of view, it's nothing more rewarding in football than being and taking part as a referee in a game. Um, and it's not just because the focus is on referees, it's because you have a job to do, uh, like many others within football. But yeah, it's really rewarding uh, and can now be um, a fantastic career. 
What got you involved personally? Um, basically, I were, the, the gauntlet was thrown down to me um, whilst I was in, serving in the Royal Navy uh, and I, we had nothing to do on a, 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 while I was in dry dock mm. um, and I decided that one of the things I'd volunteer to do was uh, go on to a referee course. Um, so that was in 1982, so uh, as you can imagine now, I've been refereeing a few years now. Um, I, I, yeah, and I really enjoyed the <coughs> role, it took me to places that I would never have ever got to as a footballer. So you often hear of young lads saying, you know, I want to be a footballer when I'm older. Not very often saying I want to be a referee. So how mm. do you get people involved at a young age? Uh, I think it's engaging not just with the youth teams, um, but also into the schools. Mm. Um, uh, we've got a big catchment area within the schools and local youth football. And we can get our next uh, bunch of referees. Um, and when we dangle the carrots, as Howard Webb um, once started as a young person on a referees course, and he's attained well the, the pinnacle of football involved in the World Cup and also the European Champions League final. What kind yeah. of person does it take? What sort of attributes do you need to be a successful um, referee? I'm sure Ken will have <laughs> his own Ken. opinions on that one. It'll be thick skinned. Uh, and, uh, I think some there is very, uh, yeah, mm. you've got to have some. Uh, some composure about you, I think, because the, the, the eyes on you are on you quite a lot, um, and you've got some big decisions to make at times. Um, not always pleasing everybody around, but you have a job to do, uh, and you just learn to deal with it uh, and come off. Hopefully, everyone's happy <laughs> on your performance on the day. Mm. And also, in terms of the media, how do you feel the referees are presented? Because they sometimes get a lot of flack. Yeah, again, it's like the, the defenders on, on oh, it's not just the defenders, but when you see the match of the day, um, you'll see the things that go wrong always highlighted. We don't so much build on some of the good things. And when you look at the referees, it may be over the, the course of premiership games on a Saturday, um, it might be one, maybe two things that have mm. gone wrong in a game, um, but it doesn't highlight some of the other things that have gone on that the referees you know, have really done particularly <coughs> well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it is definitely uh, an interesting role, so we, we hold our hats up to you. Sounds great, and I certainly think it's one for our Matt Denson to learn and teach oh, him a definitely. little bit of discipline, I think. Mm. Moving on, Tom Reed and Stu Cox have been reading up on your questions, and here they are with a view from the estuary. Hello and welcome to this week's View from the Estuary. I think you look at the Super League in general, it's going to be a case of the usual suspects, your Warringtons, your St Helens, your Leeds Rhinos, your Wigan Warriors, all at the top. I think they'll be good for a playoff play, so, but then it's a bit of a lottery then. Maybe they can get to the final, but I think winning it is just out of touch for them. Yeah, you've got your, your regulars, if you like, at the top of the league, yeah. Yeah, so they're going to be there probably, or thereabouts, mm. which means the whole sides are going to be just behind that, you know, possibly lower. Yeah, there's always a shock yeah. every now and then, so who knows? No. The reason I say that is mm. because we look at the squad size, there's 16 first team players, I think, as we mentioned at the start of the season. Uh, that's not yeah. enough for promotion, let alone a successful cup run. And obviously, you look at last season, they concentrated on that cup and it cost them promotion effectively. Yeah, I think Grimsby do need to be in the automatic promotion place. They don't want to be in the playoffs again. It could demoralise the squad even further. Very short squad, like I said. I think it's around 16, 18 players. And they are looking at bringing in a loan signing as well due to injuries in, in the defence. Can they get to the final? No. Maybe the quarterfinals though, but Colville Town away must be a win for Town, surely. To be honest, no, I think there's going to be two, maybe three go. Adam Lallana as the 23rd man, Fraser Forster as a backup goalkeeper, and maybe Tom Cleverley, he might sneak onto the plane. They were the only ones who really did anything for me. For Roy Hodgson to come round though and say it wasn't about the result, it was a lesson. But a lesson in what? They were appalling on Friday. Yeah, you have to say, you use these friendly matches to sort of test out new players, see if they can perform yeah. on this sort of international stage. They didn't, to be honest. So I don't think Royal pick them again for such a you know a big stage as the World Cup. I think they might have to wait until the qualifiers next year uh, for another mm. chance. So I think he'll stick with his more experienced players that have already been there and done that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, thank you for your questions. If you have a question as well, you can get in contact with us. It's at Ask Estuary on Twitter. Thanks again, guys. Time to go to a break now, but join us again in a few minutes' time. Welcome back to On The Bench. 
Now, you may have seen over the weekend the FA Trophy match between Altrincham and Colwyn Bay. It was abandoned after 83 minutes due to the referee being injured. Altrincham, who were 2-0 up, plucked a substitute referee from the crowd, but the losing side's manager refused to play on, stating you cannot have any Tom, Dick or Harry coming in to finish the game and rejected a replacement ref. What about this, Ken? What's the situation? Well, it, it happens very, very irregular, so it's not a regular occurrence. But at senior level, you've got a fourth official. But in games below that, then you've obviously got to have the necessary people with the necessary qualifications. And I happen to agree that you cannot just pluck somebody from the stand and ask him to, it, what would amount to be, uh, coming into a very serious game of football. And uh, I suppose at the end of the day, if you say yes, then it, that's the problem that you've got. But I would agree with him that the best thing to do would be to uh, just say, I'm sorry, but we need to have clear confidence in the person who's, who's being asked to do it. And has he got the actual qualifications that are required to referee at that level or even line at that level? Mm. I mean, Steve, is there any protocol for a lower league? Because as Ken said, higher up we have fourth officials, <laughs> but lower down, is there any protocol in place? Uh, not really, other than uh, send a call out into the crowd to yeah. see if there's anyone present mm. who is a referee. Um, usually at the senior games, uh, at Ken's level, especially in North Counties East League, you will get many people that are there as supporters of football that are referees as well. Uh, and I, I'm led to believe in this game that a, a guy who was there was a referee, qualified, mm. um, but attended in, in the capacity as a spectator and had maybe had uh, one or two drinks um, during the game. Um, so I think that's the main reason why the, uh, obviously the, the away team manager decided that I don't think there was a suitable replacement. Mm. And whose decision is that to make? I it think it's it's all obviously it's going to be a headache for the yeah. FA, um, but the the main thing is, is as Ken quite rightly said, there's some big decisions to be made. and wouldn't like anyone seriously injured because uh, an official had got a wrong decision, or even a game, uh, you know, led to being a farce because of somebody who may have been intoxicated slightly. Mm -hmm. Were well, Colwyn Bay right to to take the situation into their own hands here and reject? Uh, there's no other thing to do. It's the only thing they can do. Um, you know, there's no nobody steps in. There's no fourth official, as Ken said, for in the lower leagues. Um, so basically, it's just down to what they can manage on the day. Hopefully, they can all agree. You must have, you know, so you must have come across this situation a few times. Yeah, I've stepped in as a fourth official uh, on a couple of occasions uh, in a Premier well, in, in the football league, um, and it, the call does go out, but it's very, very rare. Mm, definitely. Well, thank you very much for both your viewpoints on that one. Mm. Well, of course, the big one last week was Grimsby Town against Scunthorpe United, which resulted in a nil-nil draw, a fixture of great importance to supporters of both sides, and they meet again tonight at the Irons' home ground, Glanford Park. One of the other local derbies that took place was between two teams that both play out of the same ground in Grimsby. Of course, it can only be Clee Town against Ken's very own Grimsby Borough at the Bradley Football Development Centre. Stu Cox went to check it out. After the euphoria of last weekend's FA Cup tie at Blundell Park, we turn our attention to Cleethorpe Town in what is possibly their biggest week in the club's history. They start tonight in the Lincolnshire Senior Trophy second round against Grimsby Borough a tie known as the Battle of the Bradley. It's great for me, it's great for the players because I don't think we're particularly handling being top of League Two at the minute. I think it's a little bit of pressure that we're not used to. So I think it's a great uh, distraction for the lads and, and for me as well because I get nervous enough on the line in the league game so it works out. Works out great, it's come at a good time for us. How good is this game for the local area? It's bound to be good because it gets people out of the houses, it gets everybody interested and everybody's looking forward to it. It's not, it's not one that many people drop out of. They all want to play in this game. I'm sure. There have been four of the Battle of the Bradleys in the past two seasons. Cleethorpe's have won all four by an aggregate score of 12 5. Can it change in this game?
joined by Pete at half time. 1 1. Is it a fair reflection on the game so far? Um, I think it is. From what I've seen of it, I think maybe Grimsby's not as uh, dominant as uh, Cleethorpe's are at the moment. Cleethorpe's looking really good. Maybe two or three chances should have put away. Yeah, but other than that, you know, it's a fair reflection, I suppose. Yeah. Could this game end up at penalties, do you think? Um, no, I think the way the way it's going, there's going to be a lucky goal somewhere that's going to finish this game. Um, yeah, I think maybe a lucky goal. Uh, second half, I think maybe Cleethorpe should come out a bit stronger. Joined by the assistant manager and the player who scored the winning goal. John, tell us, did you mean that? Yeah, of course I did. I just went, basically, went to put it in the air post, but then I changed my mind and put it in the far post. Put the keeper on his front foot. A great result for Cleethorpe's time. Do you think they can use this as a propeller for the rest of the season, hopefully get up into the next league? Yeah, hopefully. That, that's, uh, that's been our goal from, from the off, really. The, the uh, cups that we have are a slight distraction, if I'm being honest and that is our main concern in the league. A harsh defeat, would you say? Yeah, it's hard to take. Uh, didn't play well, but we should have had something out of it. We had five chances, clear cut, which should have been put away. But if you don't take your chances in football, you don't deserve anything. It's as simple as that. And good luck to play town. I am literally on the bench. And what a fantastic game these football fans, 226 of them who turned up today, have been treated to. The biggest week in Cleethorpe Town's history, has prevailed in game one. A great win, and they go through to the next round. Thanks, Steve. Good job. Another subject that's appeared on the sporting radar over the weekend is in rugby. The Australian team suspended six players for one match, and nine have been warned about consumption of alcohol. This is despite beating Ireland, you may recall. Well, the management have said we need to continue to reinforce the need for our players to make smart decisions to benefit the team. So what are the limits surrounding this? First of all, let's uh, talk to you about this, Ken. This is all about discipline, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, discipline is the one thing that I was brought up on. I'm sure Steve was in the referees game. But in our day of, of playing football, w it was hammered into us. The uh, discipline was the mainstream of the game. And that's, that's where you got your success from. Mm. And that applies to all, whether you're touring at home or abroad, or you're just playing uh, the local pitches. Uh, Friday night, you stay in. Uh, you don't drink from Wednesday onwards um, and that sort of thing. It's an absolute essential part of bringing young kids through through the game to the pro game. Without that, they've got nothing. And do you think this is the correct kind of discipline that's been brought for the rugby players? Absolutely. It has to be maintained. There has to be somebody at the top who says, this is not acceptable. You've not been brought here to do that. You've been brought here to do a job. You're representing your country and you're also privileged to be in the position of playing the game that you all love and people like watching and yet you're setting these standards, whether it be in any sport, those are the standards that are set for you mm. and you have to abide by the rules. If not, then like anything else, get on the next mm. play now. There have been other examples, haven't there, Steve? Yeah, I mean, you just look at the recent um, instance involving the England Rugby League team where a couple of players have been suspended and, and um, uh, thrown out the the actual party, even though they're not touring. Um, and again, it's they're the role models that people should be aspiring and looking up to. And, you know, they've got to be them person that people expect them to be. Yeah, absolutely. And I totally agree with both of you on that one. Mm. Well, sadly, that's all we've got time for this week. Thank you very much to Ken Vincent and Steve Lazenby for joining us in the Thank studio. You. And thanks to you for watching. We'll be back next week when we're not only on Virgin Media Channel 879, but also on the Big E. We'll be with you on Freeview TV, channel number 8. So don't forget to retune your set-top box. And as usual, be online too. Take care. Goodbye.